Good afternoon. Welcome and thank you all for joining us for the third workshop in the Pollinator and Habitat Technical Workshop Series focused on restoration project planning, native plant material selection, and site preparation for large-scale projects. I'm Elizabeth Kaufman from Pollinator Partnership. And for today's workshop, I will be joined by my colleagues, Isaac Lyle and James Hart. We would like to invite all of you to actively participate in today's workshop by submitting questions for each of the presenters through the Q&A function, which can be found either on the bottom or right-hand corner of your screen. Questions can be entered both during and after each of the presentations. Due to some slight technical issues this morning, we are reversing the order of presentations and we'll begin today's workshop with site selection, with site selection through site preparation methods on large-scale projects by Julia Chemnitz. Julia works as a private lands biologist for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, Partners for Fish and Wildlife Program in Southern Indiana. For over six years, Julia has assisted landowners with habitat restoration projects, ranging from schoolyard gardens to large-scale, multi-year native prairie restorations. Julia served as the Indiana State Lead for Pollinator Partnerships Monarch Wings Across Eastern Broadleaf Forest Program, and has continued to partner with P2 through Project Wingspan working to interface and bring program supplied resources into multiple habitat restoration projects. Please welcome Julia Kemnes. Thank you, Elizabeth, for the introduction. As Elizabeth said, my name is Julia Kemnitz, and I am with U.S. Fish and Wildlife Services Partners for Fish and Wildlife Program, working to restore a wildlife habitat in South Central Indiana. And today I will be talking to you all about site selection through site preparation methods for large scale prairie projects. So the steps in our prairie restoration are all related and cannot be completely discussed independently from each other. So there may be a little overlap in the presentations and these topics. But basically your prairie restoration process uh, starts with a project plan and a budget, um, selecting the site for your prairie restoration and then preparing the specific seed mix for that site. And then you move into the site preparation and then the planting and then the maintenance of your newly planted prairie. And so today we are gonna focus on the site selection and the site preparation part of this whole restoration process. So with site selection, uh, there are many different components that you want to take into consideration. And the first of these um, is the size and the shape of this potential prairie site. So the size is important because it influences your planting method of the prairie. And for this presentation, we are focusing on larger sites, so sites that are generally greater than five acres in size, and that changes what planting methods are available um, to you in your prairie. And when I say shape of your prairie planting, what I really mean is that, generally speaking, one larger contiguous prairie is more beneficial than several smaller. Um, prairie restorations, and I say that because generally there's going to be more edge in multiple smaller prairie projects, um, and so that increases your chance for unwanted um, or invasive species to come into your prairie planting, and generally from a wildlife standpoint, it's better to have one larger block of habitat than several smaller blocks of habitat. Um, and so next is the site history. And the best source of information for the site history is the landowner. Uh, they have seen the sites in a variety of different conditions in different seasons. And it's information that you won't get seeing the site at the one specific time that you visit it. Um, so the landowner is really a wealth of information when it comes to the history of the site. But you can also get some information from looking at aerial photographs uh, going back in time. Um, you can see how the site has been previously utilized and changed over time. And any historical maps or things like that uh, can really give you some perspective of the past history of the site. 
and give you more information to utilize when you make your plan for your prairie planting. Um, the next thing to consider with a potential prairie selection site is site access for equipment. Uh, site preparation, planting, and follow-up maintenance all require equipment. And some of that equipment may be large, uh, such as a no-till uh, seed drill. So you wanna make sure that that's possible to have an access point in the site that you select. Um, you didn't wanna get far enough in your plan uh, and then realize that you have no access point to your site for the equipment. So you wanna choose a site um, that has a good access point where you can get all of your equipment onto the site. Um, along those lines, you wanna take into consideration the topography of the site. Are there steep slopes that large equipment could have issues with? Uh, safety is always the most important factor. And so it's good to take into consideration um, if the equipment can safely maneuver on some of these slopes. But you also wanna take into consideration any erosion concerns, um, especially if your planting or site preparation plan has um, any potential for bare soil. Uh, if you have some really steep slopes, um, that could influence your plan and we don't wanna cause any potential um, erosion with the soil. So next is the sun exposure. Uh, typically when we're looking at native prairie restorations, we're looking at full sun or mostly sun prairies. So it's important to look at how much shade uh, the site gets at different times of day. Um, that will also influence the seed mix that you choose. Um, and then next is the soil type. So USDA, uh, the United States Department of Agriculture, um, has a really good resource called the Web Soil Survey. And it allows you to map your specific site in the software, and then you get specific soil data. Um, so it gives you information not only on the soil type, but the moisture levels and more. And so it, this detailed information really will contribute to your prairie restoration plan um, and gives you a really good idea of what is on site. And it's always good to double check uh, this data on the ground by doing a site visit um, and see since in some instances the site may have been altered, but it's a great first step when selecting a site for a prairie restoration. Uh, next is the moisture retention. So basically, how do, does the soil hold water? So it could be uh, a dry site, so well-drained soils, uh, mesic, well-drained with moisture retaining soils, or wet mesic, so it's seasonally saturated, or wet, so it seasonally holds water in low spots. And again, this information will very greatly influence uh, the plant species selection in your seed mix. So as you can see at this picture as the, at the top, um, this site was described to me as the land, from the landowner as being sometimes wet. Um, and that description can cover a wide range. And so this is what I saw when I got to the site. And so very clearly this crop field uh, gets very wet. And so just by seeing this in the, my one site visit, that altered our site planting plan for the site. So we had to, um, since the site was too wet for a no-till drill, we had to change our planting method to a broadcast seeding. So really seeing the site is uh, pretty important in making your site selection determination and it will influence your planting plan as well. So current vegetation. Um, so this slide in general will have the most influence on your site preparation plan. So the first thing is to look at your current vegetation. Um, what is growing currently on the site? So it's important to be able to identify all of the plant species in your possible planting area. Um, so again, this will determine what site prep is required. Um, so if desired native species are present on that site, an interseeding may be a better option than starting from scratch. Um, but Invasive species are also very important to take note of. 
So all invasive species present on your site need to be controlled before planting. Uh, depending what species is present, it may require a longer site preparation window. So not only do you need to evaluate the vegetation that is currently on the actual planting site, but the surrounding vegetation will give you several um, useful tips on how to manage your future prairie, because it's a good indicator of future management issues. Uh, for example, at this site in the picture, um, it's a cool season grass field, and off to the left behind the walking trail is a creek with a tree line um, that, and this creek frequently floods. So this indicated to me that the prairie planting would have invasive species threats from the creek flooding, and also from that tree line of volunteer growth of trees in the prairie. So we were able to anticipate those future management issues and were prepared for that in our management plan. Something else to take into consideration if you are planting a native prairie next to a crop field, um, if there are concerns about herbicide drift, it may be a good idea to keep a buffer in between the current crop field and your restored prairie. Some additional things to take into consideration are any other goals of the project besides restoring this native prairie. Uh, for example, uh, that could be adding in some educational components. So are there going to be walking trails within this prairie or um, on the side? It, it, as you can see in this picture, you know, sometimes a grass buffer in between a walking trail and the actual prairie is a good idea. And um, also with the education component, if you are supplementing your planting with plugs, uh, is that going to be close to a water source or do you need to plan the location of your planting to have access to some sort of water source? So just taking that into consideration um, to fully utilize the educational components and work that into your plan. Um, and lastly, the some other important things uh, to take note of any structures in the area, such and any structures such as buildings, um, sheds, the like, any power lines or drainage systems. Uh, power lines are especially important if you are considering using prescribed fire as a management tool or even during your site preparation. You do not wanna be conducting a prescribed burn underneath power lines. So it's important to take that into consideration um, since you might need to not be planting under those power lines or utilize a different management tool in the future. Um, if there are any drainage systems on site, it's good to be aware of that. Uh, any tile or outlet pipes or any other water management structures, uh, especially if those need to be maintained, it might be a good idea to leave a buffer um, around those so you're not planting native prairie all the way up to those structures so people can get in and out of there to do maintenance as needed. So moving on to site preparation, uh, keep in mind that these are general recommendations. Uh, each site needs to be evaluated on an individual basis, but these will provide you some nice general guidelines to site preparation. Thorough site preparation is absolutely critical to a successful prairie restoration. It takes time and patience, so do not rush the process and make sure you make a plan. Uh, site preparation is determined by the site's current vegetation, and we will go over common starting site conditions, but generally expect site preparation to take several seasons. Proper site preparation will result in a more successful prairie with less management in the future. The goal of site preparation is to prepare the site for optimal seed soil contact when you're planting, and it will also reduce future plant competition in your prairie. So do not underestimate the weed seed bank potential in your soil. Just because you don't see it in the active growing vegetation doesn't mean it's still in the soil bank and can be released when there's any bare dirt. So site preparation also requires 
consistent monitoring uh, of the site to kind of evaluate progress and be able to adapt your plan from there. Uh, the planting method will influence your site preparation as well, uh, there, and also the timing of your site preparation. So there are several different combinations of techniques and strategies for site preparation. Um, broadcast seeding might require some extra site preparation to further prepare the soil as, um, as compared to using a no-till drill. And to control existing vegetation on large sites, the most effective method of site preparation is herbicide. When used responsibly, is a very effective tool in habitat restoration. Identify the appropriate herbicide for the site and the vegetation that you are targeting. Always read the product labels and follow manufacturer's directions. The following recommendations are general and um, may vary by the site. So glyphosate is commonly used as a broad spectrum herbicide and used very frequently to control vegetation in prairie restoration projects. But be sure to contact professionals for specific herbicide questions or recommendations. Uh, for perennial vegetation, a minimum of two herbicide applications is recommended. The first herbicide treatment will target current growing vegetation on the site, and the second and potentially more sprains will target any regrowth and germination of new weed seeds in the soil bank. So now we will go into site preparation for common sites you may encounter. Uh, such as crop fields, grass-dominated sites, such as turf grass, pastures, hay fields, and then sites that have recently undergone construction and desired vegetation um, is desired to be planted. So crop fields are one of the easiest places to restore native prairie because really the site preparation work has already been completed for you. Uh, perennial weeds have already been controlled and important to inquire, it's important to inquire about the herbicide use history on the site. Um, some specific herbicides used on crop fields in previous years can reside in the soil and prevent growth of your prairie restoration. Um, so it's important to make sure if those chemicals have been used that maybe you postpone your prairie planting for a couple of years and make sure that that residual herbicide is out of the soil because you don't want to plant and then have your prairie be inhibited by these uh, residual herbicides. So soybean fields have minimal residual material. Um, so generally speaking, not much site preparation needs to go into that. However, corn fields with remaining stalks may need to be disked lightly, uh, kind of to break them up if you're using a no-till drill to plant, because uh, generally an uneven surface or having kind of objects in the way will disrupt the planting of a no-till drill. So as you can see in the picture above, there are some of the remaining corn stalks um, that needed to be lightly disked. So we have someone going over those lightly to kind of lightly work it up and um, get a more even soil profile. And then down below where our natives are starting to grow up, you can see there's still some litter on the ground, but that's perfectly fine uh, and won't um, inhibit your prairie planting. But if necessary, um, after crops are harvested or you're planting in the next spring, um, if you, there are some annual weeds that pop up that you need to take care of before planting, um, a glyphosate treatment before planting will go ahead and take care of that. So site preparation for turf, pastures, and hay fields. So most commonly these fields are cool season grasses. So once again, make sure you identify all of the growing vegetation on site. And this site preparation is assuming that there's no desirable vegetation on site that you're trying to work around. Cool season grasses require longer periods of site preparation, um, generally because they're more persistent. 
So treatment in multiple growing seasons is recommended. Uh, so there's two example timelines I have here. So mowing vegetation to four inches or lower, and then allowing for some time before regrowth before spraying. If the vegetation is very tall, you may need to mow, um, do a couple of consecutive mowings, gradually reducing the vegetation height um, so that there's not as much thatch uh, and you're not smothering whatever is on the ground. And so after the mowing and spraying, uh, wait a couple of weeks to assess the kill. And then um, depending on what time of year you're doing this, so if you're mowing in early spring, applying the glyphosate and then repeating throughout the summer and the growing season, then you'll be ready to plant um, most likely in the do a dormant seeding in early winter. Um, conversely, if you're starting your site prep in late or late summer, early fall and applying the glyphosate later in the year, and then letting the site go through winter and then following up in the spring with a glyphosate treatment. Um, and then it, theoretically your site would be ready to drill in, uh, use no-till drill to plant in the spring, assuming your vegetation has um, been adequately controlled. So if you're broadcast seeding, uh, a light disking may be needed to break up the cool season uh, residual sods. But if drilling, uh, dead vegetation can actually remain, um, especially on erosion prone sites, because those roots are still holding the soil in. And a note on tilling. So tilling is a method of site preparation that you may come across. And tilling in lieu of using herbicides is not a viable method of site preparation. Disturbance to the soil releases new weed seeds from the seed bank each time it's disturbed, and continual tillage can result in soil loss from erosion. And several weed, weed species also thrive on soil disturbance, like Canada thistle. So tilling will not eliminate those weeds and in actuality may cause those um, invasive species problems to worsen along with contribute to soil erosion. So generally speaking, um, for large scale restoration projects, tilling is not a viable option. Uh, hillsides are a common place to plant native prairie uh, to reduce future mowing. And these sites are also prone to erosion. And so it's best that they are not left with exposed soil for prolonged periods of time. Um, so again, with those site preparation methods, you know, leaving that cool season grass in place to be able to drill right into that dead cool season grass uh, will kind of eliminate that erosion issue, which is pretty important. Um, if smaller woody um, undesired vegetation is present on the site, like small trees or shrubs, uh, they will need to be treated with specific herbicides before planting. Uh, spring burn can assist with woody vegetation control, um, but keep in mind that that will also encourage regrowth of other vegetation on the site. Um, so like your grass species and annual weeds. So just be prepared for that. Uh, you might need to do a follow-up herbicide treatment if you're planting after that. And then invasive species and noxious weeds, um, they need to be controlled over multiple seasons and sometimes even years. Uh, late summer and early fall are great opportunities to control um, as the plant is directing energy to the roots. But again, be sure to identify all of these species beforehand and find some data on how to most adequately control uh, these noxious weed species because the last thing you want is to have those remain in your native prairie planting and have to manage those on top of your native species that you are trying to keep in the planting. And then lastly, um, something you may come across is newly constructed sites um, where there's bare soil and the, um, there needs, there's a need for native vegetation. So it's the same site preparation methods in some cases, but here are some 
additional facts to consider. Um, so these sites, you know, have a very altered soil profile. So any data you may have found of what was historically present is probably not present anymore. Um, it, there may have been new soil brought in, but at any rate, it's been so disturbed um, that the soil profile is might be completely different than what you think it is. With large uh, machinery going over these construction sites, uh, soil compaction is one of the biggest concerns. And if the soil is compacted too much and you plant your native prairie seeds, um, they won't be able to germinate. So one way to deal with the site preparation on these sites is to kind of loosen that soil back up again. Um, and then lightly packing it down, so disking the site a little bit and then packing it down a little bit or disking and then planting and then packing um, just to kind of loosen that soil a little bit if it's too compacted from heavy machinery. Uh, another thing that you'll come across are large dirt clods. So um, kind of like with the crop residue, if, there's, if the dirt clouds are too big, um, a no-till drill will have great difficulty going through that and it may not properly plant your seed. So if there are large dirt clouds still on the site, um, go ahead and again, disc and break up those dirt clouds and get, you want um, the soil particle size to be around the same size. And that will greatly help you when you're planting to get an even planting. Um, again, like the other sites, any weeds that pop up, especially because the soil has been so disturbed, make sure to control those weeds before planting. And then again, with all this exposed dirt, um, take extra care with soil stabilization. So we want to establish vegetation as quickly as possible on those sites, um, but just something to be aware of that you don't want to keep that loose dirt around for long. So um, whether that be packing the soil a little bit before planting or adding some additional species to your mix, mix um, some annual oats or something, just be aware of that. Okay, so interseeding. So this is where we are adding species diversity to a site where there are desired species already present. Um, so typically these interseeding sites are grass heavy sites that are lacking forb diversity, whether it was previously planted and maybe there weren't enough forbs in the mix or over time, the forb component kind of dropped out of the planting. Um, you may run into some need for site preparation to interseed some forbs. And so how you do that is you'll need to suppress the growing vegetation and reduce litter. So there are a couple of ways to do these things, um, including some herbicide applications, mowing um, to reduce, uh, to open up the sunlight to the ground for that seed soil contact in your inner seeding, prescribed fire, um, and disking. So for mowing, what that will accomplish is suppresses the grass and halts seed development. Um, so you, it does not manage the litter on the ground, but you're really trying to inhibit that grass growth. Um, and depending on what grasses um, you are trying to manage, um, cool season or warm season, the timing will be important because you want to hit that grass in the active growth stage. Uh, for prescribed fire uh, burning, so that will remove the litter and provide um, ample seed soil contact for your inner seeding. And again, that will, um, timing will be an important factor in that. So the site preparation summary, um, basically make a plan, but be prepared for that plan not to go according to plan. So allow for some flexibility. Uh, remember the goal, and that's you want your site to be ready for that optimal seed soil contact. So however method you need to get to that, um, just keep the goal in mind. So choose the appropriate methods for your site uh, so you get the most adequate site preparation. And then again, allow enough time uh, for that and extend it if needed. This is 
extremely critical for the success of your prairie. So take all the time you need because um, you do not want to have to be managing these species that you wanted to get rid of while trying to encourage the growth of your new prairie. And as always consult local professionals and organizations as needed for any information or assisting you in your site development plan. Um, a lot of universities and colleges have extension offices that have a lot of great recommendations um, and scientific data. Uh, local co-ops will have knowledge on herbicide. And um, now if you have any questions, I will be here to answer them. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Julia. And with that, we would like to invite you all to enter your questions in the Q&A function box. And we'll start with a question from Athena. Uh, she asks, how does glyphosate, does glyphosate in the soil affect plants that grow in later years in the pollinators that feed on them? Okay, um, so when using glyphosate, so that's one of the more common broad spectrum herbicides, I'd say, that are used in prairie restorations. And again, so that glyphosate is really targeting the growing vegetation on the site at that time. In terms of the soil residual on that, I believe it's a couple of days up to a couple of hundred days, and that depends on um, the climate you're in and the site conditions. I am not completely aware of how it affects the plants that are growing in later years and the pollinators, but to my knowledge, um, there's, there's no serious detrimental effects. But again, that is kind of outside my range of expertise. But when we're using the glyphosate on native prairie preparation and then planting our native prairie, um, it doesn't inhibit any germination of the native prairie plants. Um, and pollinators generally are very attracted to those plants the first year. So um, I would recommend contacting a professional on, to get a more specific answer to that question. Uh, but generally, I would say there, I have not seen any serious detrimental effects. Excellent, thank you. Uh, we have another question um, about invasives um, and the control of invasives. Uh, Connie asks, if there are fire sensitive invasives and noxious weeds present, will prescribed fire work after the planting is established? Okay, great question. Uh, so I would say this completely depends on what invasive or noxious species you're talking about. Um, in my experience, unfortunately, most noxious and invasive species really thrive on fire, uh, which is really frustrating because it's a great management tool. But a lot of those like Canada thistle and Johnson grass, um, Lespedeza, they really love that disturbance to the prairie. And so it can actually make your problem worse. Um, but in terms of using prescribed fire for things like um, get rid of some woody vegetation that aren't noxious or invasive species, it works pretty well. So I would recommend uh, knowing your enemy in your prairie and knowing what you're trying to control and then get that information on how to best treat it, uh, whether that be you know, manly, manually mowing it or using an herbicide or prescribed fire. Because uh, the thing you don't want to do is experiment and then that could potentially make your problem worse. So I would say this completely depends on what species you're trying to control. Awesome. Thank you. We have a couple questions about uh, planting. Uh, first question is, what is your preferred time of year for planting, frost seeding or spring seeding? And then another question asks, what's the best time of year or month for planting fall, seed planting or over winter? Okay, well, this is probably a good segue yeah, <laughs> into yeah. some next, next um, presentations. But I will say in relation to site prep, because I know the planting will actually be covered in another presentation, but I'm glad to hear you all are already thinking about it. Um, I will just say that your site preparation, as I mentioned in the presentation, does directly correlate to your uh, planting method. So whether you're planting in the spring or the fall, you're going to want to time your site preparation to match up with that. Um, 
you know, just to, to prepare you for those presentations, I will say both spring and fall or dormant seeding plantings were great. It kind of depends on your location, um, but I'm sure the planting presentation will be able to answer a lot of your questions. Thank you. Um, we have another question that it, which reads, uh, do you have tips for landscapes that have decades worth of low quality trees encroaching? This person has dealt with some acres uh, by hiring a bulldozer, but thinks that it is disruptive uh, for the remaining acres. Uh, she would like to know how to deal with these old junk, these old junk trees. Yeah, so that's a pretty common problem with native prairies, especially it sounds like maybe there'll be some, there's some woods uh, bordering your site. And so those natural succession, those trees are going to want to come in. And you're correct that sometimes just manually controlling those trees uh, can result in a lot of repeated work and a lot of soil disturbance, which isn't always ideal. Um, so I would say you might need to look at some herbicide treatments, um, whether with larger trees, it'll probably be a cut stump treatment or tree girdling. Um, again, I would identify your species and then you can pinpoint the most effective herbicide for that species and control it that way. Um, I think that might be a little bit more effective than just doing the repeated bulldozing and kind of that high level maintenance. Excellent. Thank you. Um, let's see. Next question. Um, under, for understanding the soil composition of your site, is that mostly a visual inspection of the soil or do you use a more in-depth soil test? Well, so it, it kind of depends on the site. So like I said, I normally get that um, preliminary information from web soil survey just to get some sort of idea of what I'm dealing with, whether it's clay or sandy soils, how much moisture. But then, um, you know, actually going out into the site can give you a good clue of the moisture retention. But again, there's a lot of other factors you're not seeing. So you can do some additional soil tests, um, do a soil bore. You know, it can be as simple as sticking a key in the ground and kind of feeling the soil in between um, and getting that more detailed information because like I said in the presentation, some of these sites may have been pretty altered, so it's pretty hard to kind of get an accurate description of what that soil is until you're actually in that current state where you're preparing to do a site preparation. Um, so yes, you can definitely do some more testing, and then if you're looking for something a little bit uh, more scientific than my, uh, you know, handling the dirt, um, I would contact one of your loyal uh, local soil and water conservation districts or USDA and a lot of times they have some more specific equipment that can help you really identify what your soil type is. Thank you. That's very helpful. Uh, Megan asks, uh, uh, she knows it's specific to the site, but, do, but Julia, do you have recommendations for, for sites that are established but have invasives encroaching? specifically reed canary grass and Canada thistle? Ah, the two big ones. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So unfortunately, as you know, those are uh, an uphill battle. Um, so it's definitely required vigilance. Um, what will help is that if it is an already established native prairie site, uh, hopefully those root systems in the native prairie are helping to battle um, these invasives. But Unfortunately, it is kind of an uphill battle. So I would say keep going and year after year with the appropriate timing for your um, for your control methods for things like reed canary and Canada thistle. Um, that will really you want to be able to do your management activities at the times that it will have the most impact on the plants. So for example, Canada thistle, a really great time to control that is in the fall when a lot of the energy reserves of the plant are going down into its root systems. So I'd recommend looking up some common information that will give, or um, some online information that will be able to give you very specific um, instructions on how to apply the herbicide and maybe uh, usually with thistle it involves some mowing um, to not let the plant seed out. But I would say to really target your management activities to when it will most effectively manage the plant. So you're not doing unnecessary work and you'll really get the most bang for your buck. That's fantastic advice. Thank you. Um, Jamie asks, what are your thoughts on using seed blankets on hillsides and steep slope sites? Yeah, so I have encountered a couple of those, especially on, you know, uh, some of the sites where it's undergone construction recently. You know, generally with native prairie um, restorations, we don't typically use those as much. Uh, there's 
can sometimes be a worry of getting enough sunlight to the ground. That being said, on some sites where erosion is such a concern, um, you know, we're talking completely bare, dry dirt, where that's a concern. I have seen native prairie um, flourish from using it. So it really depends the pro and con on your site, but I would say use it maybe as a kind of last resort if you're really worried about um, erosion. Otherwise, if you can, typically what we'll do is with your native prairie seed mix, um, use kind of a filler species like annual oats that will quickly establish and grow and kind of help hold that soil in place until your native vegetation comes in. Um, so that being said, I would do some more research and maybe talk to some of the soy or, um, seed nurseries and things like that. But I have seen those used and with a successful prairie outcome, but typically um, you can get away with not using those. Yes, so thank you. Um, Devin asks, uh, you stress the importance of eliminating any weeds during the site prep and before you plant seeds. Obviously you want to control invasives with as much intensity and frequency as possible. Would you use that same intensity on less noxious weeds that are unlikely to have long-term persistence at the site once the natives become established? Good question. You know, typically, this is, this is your best opportunity when you're doing your site preparation stage to get rid of any and all of the weeds that are undesired in your site. So I would say making that a priority during your site preparation, um, since you're already doing it for the other species on your site, if you have an noxious weed or some sort of identified problem species, um, it really is the best opportunity to do that management now. Um, and along with all the other, you know, the cool season grasses or other noxious weeds that you are worried about, once you plant your native prairie, it makes it incredibly more difficult to manage those species with your undesired species. So even if you think it might not be a problem and you have the opportunity to take care of it, I would go ahead and do that just to be on the safe side so that your native prairie can just flourish. That was very wise. Thank you. Um, Stefan asks, are there any special considerations you could mention for projects in reclaimed strip mined areas? Um, he imagines that, that some of the soil issues are similar to those in construction sites, as you had mentioned. Yeah, so I personally don't have a ton of experience um, with strip mines, except for I do know that the soil composition can be very disturbed. So I would say taking a look at it and um, seeing there might be some issues too with some more of the like heavy gravel type kind of um, substrate and the disturbed soil profile. So I would take a look at it and kind of follow loosely the construction site planting guidelines that I've given. But if your site really is, you know, like large, um, you know, rocks and gravel substrate, you're going to need a pretty specialized prairie mix. So you probably won't be able to do like a typical mesic prairie or things, but these are pretty hardy native plants in some circumstances. So I would consult with a seed nursery to um, make sure that you pick the plants that'll thrive the best on that site. But it is a really popular area of restoration, so it can be done. It just might take some additional work. All right, the next question comes from Connie. Um, she's under the impression that annual rye might be allelopathic to native species. Um, and she wants to know your opinion on that. Yes, that is true. Um, so in some circumstances, planting annual rye may not be the best method for a filler. So that would take into account um, when you are planting, but also you can also switch to an annual oat, which does not have any allelopathic effects. So if there's any concern with that, or um, it might not be appropriate for your site, switch to an annual oat, and that will serve the same purpose. Excellent. Okay, thank you. Um, um, Eric writes that he find, he's finding that some weeds only emerge after seeding, um, and he was, had not seen them when disturbing and cleaning up the ground prior to seeding. Um, is there any way to encourage the germination of weeds prior to seeding? Excellent questions. Yeah, that goes into the, you never know what's in your seed bank until you disturb it, because you can really find some interesting things in there. So absolutely, even if you do the best site prep work um, and all your planning, it is definitely still possible that you'll get some weeds that you just hadn't encountered because until that moment they couldn't they didn't have the right conditions to germinate. 
With native prairie seedings, um, if you've done a thorough job on Cyprep, a lot of those species that you'll see coming up are annual weeds, and that is okay. And honestly, there's really no way around it. Um, so for the annual weeds, that's managed by usually mowing, um, doing a high mowing with a bush hog. And so the main issue with that is getting uh, making sure the light is getting to the ground to your native prairie seeds, but annual weeds won't be a problem. Um, they can be easily managed and when your native prairie is established, it, it will grow into that. In terms of the non-annual weeds <laughs> that come up, that I would say would require uh, monitoring and then identifying those weed species and then usually it can be taken care of with um, some spot spray herbicide applications, but you know for any of these instances, um, with your establishing your native prairie, you need to be pretty vigilant um, to see, even if you know, you've know you gone over and you know what to expect in terms of some possible weed species, you never know what you're gonna get. So I would say just be vigilant and then you can um, address your treatment specifically to that um, species that you're trying to eradicate out of your prairie. Thank you. Um, this is a similar, um, so another person had asked if there's a way to determine the seed bank before planting to understand what is being held within the seed bank. All right. Um, you know, if you want to test it out, that's definitely possible. So whenever you remove any of the active growing vegetation, your seed bank is going to, um, what's in your seed bank is going to emerge. So the more I would recommend, um, you know, do the herbicide application and see, see what regrows and comes up. But I will say with any sort of soil disturbance, that's where you're really gonna see what's in your seed bank. Um, and that's why tilling is not one of the recommended site preparation methods because any turnover in that dirt, you're just releasing more seeds. But if that is your goal to see um, what you're releasing, then you could do you know a light disking or a tilling. Um, but in terms of a site preparation efficiency uh, standpoint, it's not a great one because you could be tilling for years, um, seeing what's coming up in that seed bank, and you really don't want to leave that bare soil going. But um, any sort of soil disturbance in the short will, will tell you what's in your weed seed bank. Thank you, fantastic. Um, we have another question um, about, this is more an implementation question. Uh, Christopher wants to know how important it is to calibrate a drill um, and wants to know if it becomes an issue um, if contractors rent one from local conservation departments. Okay, um, so I anticipate this will be covered in the planting portion, but I will say that it is extremely important to calibrate your drill correctly. Um, and so, and also there are many resources to help you do that because, um, you know, understandably not everyone knows how to calibrate a no-till drill. Um, but that will be determined by your seeding rate and your mixture. So you wanna know, you know how many pounds per acre your seed um, or seed squares, seeds per square foot uh, your seed mix is, and then you'll be able to properly calibrate your drill. Um, and so there's different, some will have the two boxes where the grass seed and the forb seed is separate and those will require different calibrations. Um, so, Yes, and there are drills available. So uh, depending on where you are in different organizations, so I would absolutely recommend um, utilizing that resource, but also talk to um, the organization or entity you're borrowing it from so you really understand um, this no-till drill and make sure it's the correct drill you need to um, really be able to accurately plant your planting. But hopefully some more of that information will be covered in the planting portion of this. Thank you. Um, and we have time for one more question. Um, so Chris asked for smaller sites that are one to four acres, which may be large for an individual, um, how do you advise proceeding um, on habitat restoration? Sure. Uh, so that is very common. Um, you know, sites can be 0.1 acres all the way up to that five acres and beyond. So what really changes the planting plan for that is a lot of times if it's very small, it's not feasible to use a no-till drill. So a lot of the time for those sites, um, you're looking at a planting method, the broadcast seeding. So that can kind of change um, change how you're going to do your site preparation because it might take a little bit more effort to get your site to the point where it could your seed can be broadcast seeded because you need more of that bare soil component. Um, but it absolutely can be done. And in some cases, it's 
almost a little easier because if you're doing a smaller site where you can um, adequately spend the time on it and it can be really effective. Um, if you get really small, you can kind of work into some other site preparation methods that I didn't cover, like solarization or things like that, that really aren't feasible on any uh, any even slightly larger sites. But and then if you get into the you know one acre site broadcast seeding, you can even use like a hand seeder. So it really kind of opens up some options um, in the broadcast seeding world. But you may not be able to have um, be able to use effectively some of the larger equipment like a no-till drill. But it all absolutely can be done. You can still get the same product either way. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Julia. Thank you. Really appreciate your, your responses to all the questions and your presentation. Absolutely. Thank you. All right. All right. Um, and with that, I'm now going to turn things over to my colleague, James Hart. James, thank you. Hey, thanks. Yeah, well, this next presentation is going to be given by Elizabeth. Elizabeth's passionate interest in native pollinator conservation and habitat restoration led her to pollinator partnership in 2018. Her work at P2 encompasses a wide range of native pollinator habitat restoration and enhancement projects, both within natural landscapes and in novel environments, including solar farms. In addition, she manages native plant materials amplification and distribution efforts to support conservation partners, organizations, and agencies. Elizabeth earned her Master's of Science in Plant Biology and Conservation from Northwestern University and Chicago Botanic Garden. Please welcome Elizabeth Kaufman. Thank you for the introduction, James. And hello to all our participants. I'm going to talk about native plant material selection and seed mix design for pollinator habitat enhancement and restoration as well as discuss some of the overarching considerations that are important to native plant conservation. As conservation and restoration practitioners, we have to evaluate, balance, and make determinations on multiple and sometimes confounding variables that need consideration when selecting plant materials for habitat projects. Plant material selection should always begin and be guided by clearly defined project goals and objectives. Any foreseen limitations or obstacles should also be identified and planned for. These may include budget limitations or the limited availability of locally sourced seed and genetically appropriate plant materials, adjacent land use practices, specialized soil conditions, proximity to sensitive habitat areas, or in the case of working lands, solar habitat co-location, vegetation height restrictions. And although the expanse of determining factors that need to be addressed can initially seem fantastically complicated, as well as subjective, when approached from a holistic perspective that recognizes the uniqueness found in each and every project, the decision-making process associated with plant material selection and seed mix design can become one of the most rewarding equations to solve. The primary goal of ecological restoration is to support the restoration of biologically diverse and self-sustaining communities. When we talk about restoring biodiversity, we're talking about restoring more than just individual species, but also about attempting to restore the components that together serve as the foundation for the intricate networks and ecological processes that can function as productive and resilient ecosystems. So how do we begin to approach such complex undertakings? With a jaw to, non, to John Steinbeck, we look from the micro to the macro and back again. Considerations of the measures of biodiversity are vital to the long-term success of restoration efforts. And when we approach plant material selection for pollinator and habitat conservation, we wanna include considerations beyond just plant species diversity. To begin, let's start with the micro, genetic diversity within individual species. Plant, spe plant species can vary genetically from adaptations that have evolved over time in response to varying environmental and climate conditions. This process can result in local ecotypes, a subset of plants within the same species that have adapted to these conditions and are associated with different geographic regions. 
maximizing genetic diversity increases the potential for adaptation to future conditions and long-term survival. This concept is especially important to consider when wild collecting seed for restorations and why the, why the general rules for seed collection include making collections from larger populations and from, a, from within a limited geographic distance to the restoration site. This is also highly important as you consider what you're introducing into the landscape as what we install in our projects will shape not only what the habitat area will evolve into, but also how successful your efforts will be in terms of adaptability and ultimately the longevity of these efforts. Like with all organisms, plant populations can suffer across time without genetic diversity. When populations become isolated, or if introduced plant materials have low genetic diversity, they can become susceptible to threats, such as inbreeding depression, thereby increasing the chances for weakened population health, reduced longevity, and even extirpation. Genetic diversity provides plasticity, the ability to adapt to changing environmental conditions. However, making concerted efforts to provide a high level of genetic diversity does not imply that plant, plant propagules should be include materials sourced from distant populations, as that can introduce genetics that are maladapted to your local conditions. The introduction of maladapted genes can, in some cases, dilute and weaken pre-existing local plant populations through processes such as genetic swamping. This is most important to consider if your restoration site is, is adjacent or in close proximity to sensitive areas, such as remnant habitat, and areas that support sensitive, threatened, and endangered species. We need to be especially cautious about introducing new materials into sites that are that are in close proximity to sensitive areas, and that's to protect the plant populations that have withstood the test of time and have inherently evolved through adaptation to localized conditions. Sourcing seed from remnant communities is ideal, as these, those materials may include the genetic coding, which provides the plasticity or the key to long-term persistence despite changing environmental variables. If your habitat project is, is in close proximity to a sensitive area, you can contact your state's natural, natural heritage society or state native plant society for further recommendations. When we discuss species richness, we're referring to the actual number of distinct species present in an area. And species diversity refers to the number of different species in relationship to the relative abundance of each species present. In other words, for example, if we're examining a group of 30 individual plants and we identify three distinct species, the measure of three species is an expression of species richness in the group. If we want to examine the diversity of this, <clears throat> excuse me, if we want to examine the diversity of that same group, we look at how many of each of the species are present. So a group of 30 plants containing two milkweeds, three asters, and 35 bee balm has a much lower diversity than the same group of 30 plants that's represented by 10 milkweed, 10 aster, and 10 bee balm. This is an important factor to consider when we're selecting plant materials to achieve our primary goal of providing a sufficient abundance of diverse habitat resources. When selecting plant materials, it is also vitally important to include a high number of, of diverse plant species and life forms to meet the diverse needs of pollinators and other wildlife. This includes grasses and sedges, annual, biannual, and perennial forbs, as well as flowering shrubs and trees. However, there's always caveat, however, it is really critical not to include plant species from outside of their natural range in an attempt to increase species richness and diversity. As discussed in detail during our second workshop, plant introductions can be detrimental as relocating a species to a new location without nature's evolved checks and balances system in place can enable it to become an invasive pest and further threaten wildlife habitat. Another aspect that needs consideration is structural diversity. Structural diversity can be a reflection of species diversity with the additional intention to provide diverse plant life forms. A diverse plant community provides specialized habitats and microhabitats that, that pollinators and other wildlife need to survive. 
For example, flowering shrubs and trees provide some of the earliest floral resources available to pollinators, while hollow stem bunch grasses provide overwintering habitat for bees and other insects. Many native sedge, shrub, and tree species are also very important host plants for native butterfly and moth reproduction. The importance of including diverse plant life forms can be summarized with the understanding that the greater the structural diversity restored, the greater number of insect and wildlife species will be sustained. Functional diversity is a complex measurement, but in short, it's reflective of niche and ecosystem service provision. It represents the exchanges that occur between and among plant communities, pollinators, and other wildlife. Recognizing the presence or absence of niche fulfillment within a plant community can be critical to the long-term success of the restoration effort. However, if you include measures for ensuring that there is appropriate genetic diversity within each species, measures for species richness and diversity among species, and measures for providing structural diversity, you will have provided the foundation for ongoing functional diversity that will attract and support a diverse array of wildlife and pollinating species. Plant pollinator relationships, as I'm sure most all are aware, have evolved over millennia. And as covered in our first workshop, the majority of flower visiting insects are generalists. This means that many pollinating species and some genera, such as bombus or bumblebees, can successfully meet their needs for pollen and nectar by foraging on numerous plant species across multiple genera. However, some pollinators have highly evolved specialized relationships with a single plant genus to a few genera and even, within and even with individual plant species. And the same is true for plants when considering their re reproductive needs. For example, the federally threatened eastern fringe prairie orchid is pollinated only by night flying hawk moths. Many Lepidoptera species have specialized reproductive relationships that have evolved with, spe with specific host plants, such as the Carner blue butterfly that is dependent on a single species, Lupinus perennis or wild lupin, and the monarch that is obligate to the genus Asclepius or milkweed. Knowledge of obligate relationships between plants and pollinators is a necessary guide for plant material selection. And a growing awareness of the wildlife species that have historic range within a project area will greatly increase a practitioner's skill in selecting the appropriate plant species. Okay, so let's dive into some more technical aspects. When you're designing seed mixes and selecting materials for habitat creation, it's, in, it's critical to consider the resource requirements for a diverse array of species including the specific resources needed to support the conservation of at-risk species, such as the Connor Blue, Monarchs, and the Rusty Patch Bumblebee. Seed mix design begins with selecting the appropriate species that meet the individual environmental site conditions. The species included should be representative of multiple genera with diverse phenological bloom periods to provide floral resources across all seasons. <coughs> Excuse me from early spring through summer and into the late fall. In addition, species should include those that will provide overwintering habitat. Include annual, biannual, and perennial forbs that offer floral resources in diverse colors, sizes, and shapes to meet the diverse foraging abilities, behaviors, and sizes of pollinating species and other beneficial insects. In the Midwest, for example, Include species that have deep-throated tubular and spurred flowers, such as Aquilegia, Monarda, Lobelia, or Penstemon, for hummingbirds, bumbles, and long-tongued bees, and shorter-tubed, shallow-cupped, and open-facing flowers that provide easy access to pollen and nectar for butterflies and smaller bees. Seed mixes should be designed to include a minimum of approximately 35 species, However, increasing the number of species will provide higher quality habitat and diversity. Aim to include seven to nine graminoid species, including native sedges and grasses. And when selecting perennial and annual forbs, include several species that are from the legume family. For example, lupins, partridge pea, prairie clovers, and lead plant. Installing flowering trees and shrubs, such as the salix or willows, cornice, or dogwoods, amelanchers, 
or service berries, New Jersey tea, witch hazel, magnolias, buttonbush, among many, many others. Along the perimeter of your installation, as hedgerows or interspersed as sheltered islands will provide vital resources in the early spring months and will serve as windbreaks, which assist pollinators foraging activities. Oak trees in particular are known to support more insect diversity than any other genus. Other factors to include when designing your seed mixes are the ratios of forbs to graminoids. And within those broad categories, you'll need to address the ratios of annual to perennial species. Forb to graminoid ratios can range depending on the goal of the project. When designing seed mixes for pollinator habitat, strive for ratios of 75% forbs to 25% graminoid species. Using ratios of 60% or less forb species to 40% or higher graminoid species will support habitat more so characteristic of grasslands, especially over time as graminoid species quickly outcompete forbs in just a few years. This will require management actions such as prescribed fire to begin at an earlier time. Within each floral group, the ratios of perennial species to annuals and biannuals should aim for about 85 to 90 percent perennial species to about 10 to 15 percent annual and biannual species, depending on the specific site conditions. Tools available available to you for plant selection and seed mix design include seed calculators and bloom charts. And I apologize, I realize these images are compacted to fit the slide. Creating illustrated bloom charts are highly useful to ensure sufficient provision of floral resources across all growing seasons, and especially during the times of year when fewer species are blooming, such as in the early spring, between spring and summer, and in, into the late fall. Seed calculators are really excellent tools that greatly refine the process of prescribing seed applications. Seeding rates will range from 40 seeds per square foot when drill seeding and up to 80 seeds per square foot when there's a need for erosion control and on-slope terrain. For most projects without erosion control needs, I aim for 50 seeds per square foot. Prescribing less than 40 seeds per square foot in most cases, will leave opportunities for weeds to find space to be able to reestablish. On the other hand, putting too much seed on the ground may create an overly competitive environment for the species that you're trying to establish. However, if you are broadcasting seed, it's recommended that you increase the application rate between 50 to 100 percent, and that will depend on the time of year of application, the slope, and wildlife pressure. There are multiple seed calculators available online through federal and state agencies and from other organizations, such as the one that's pictured here from NRCS. However, pre-made calculators may be limited in terms of the species included that are appropriate for your project, and they may not include less commonly available species. So building a customized calculator that includes more of the species native to your region or specific project area can be highly beneficial and well worth your time and effort. I realize that not everyone will be interested in building a custom calculator. However, for those that are interested, I'm gonna share a brief outline of how to go about it. You do elect to build a calculator. There are a number um, of information fields that you can elect to include, such as flower color, height, soil and water requirements, and so forth. I find the more information on each species that I can include in the calculator, the more helpful the tool is. At minimum or to start, Assemble your list of species. You will then need to input the number of seeds each species contains in a bulk pound, which of course is going to be highly variable depending on the species. For example, yarrow has on average 3 million seeds per pound, and common milkweed has approximately 64,000 seeds per pound. You can get information on, on the number of seeds per pound from your seed vendor. The next field to include is the number of the number of seeds per square foot that you're calling for. Calculations are then input to determine the percentage of the mix um, each species, that each species represents, and that's based on the total number of seeds per square foot you're calling for. Then calculate the pounds per acre for each species that you're calling for in the mix. 
that's found by multiplying the number of seeds per square foot by the number of square feet in an acre, or 43,560. The next calculation divides that number by the number of seeds each species contains per pound to calculate the number of pounds you'll need of each species. Finally, the costs are calculated by multiplying the bulk pounds per acre by the cost per pound for each of the species. If you would like further details, information, or specific calculations, please feel free to reach out directly to me and I would be happy to help. Okay, so when sourcing seed and plant materials, project managers need to determine how local is local enough to be able to provide well-adapted, ecologically and genetically appropriate plant materials. This can be dependent on the site's current nativity, the sensitivity of established plant communities, proximity to remnant habitat, the site's unique environmental characteristics, as well as the project's scope, goals and limitations in sourcing options. In other words, are you enhancing a natural area or, you or are you restoring at land that was highly degraded and without connectivity to other higher quality sites? Limitations for allowable distances to source materials are usually defined by the parent agency or organization. Sensitive locations, such as remnant habitat and preserves, may have strict limitations, including sourcing only from within the same site's boundaries. Other sites may limit sourcing to within the same county or across a more broadly defined region. Some agencies and organizations establish a defined measurable distance from the project site, such as within 50 miles or 175 miles. If your organization or agency does not have an established guideline for seed sourcing, you can refer to provisional seed transfer zones as developed by the U.S. Forest Service and Bauer et al. in 2014 to help define and guide limitations on sourcing materials. These provisional seed transfer zones were developed specifically to minimize the risks of including materials that are maladapted to local conditions, both environmental and climate. Here in the Midwest, we have more flexibility in sourcing in comparison to the Western states that present significant differences in elevation. Here, limitations for sourcing are greater with differences in latitude in comparison to longitude. When sourcing materials, there are a few additional things to take into consideration. If you're purchasing seed from native seed vendors, it's important to request the vendor provide seed sourcing information so that you can take that into consideration during the selection process. With the demand of native seed increasing so much faster than it is being grown, it may be necessary to source materials from more than one vendor. Species such as hemiparasites and early bloom spring ephemerals are typically very hard to acquire and some can be prohibitively expensive. However, these species are essential to restoring high quality habitat. They fill a, a niche that really, that really can't be, it, it, it's really difficult, if not impossible to substitute. Um, an important aspect of project planning may be to include wild collection of those species. With sufficient planning, you could simultaneously be conducting site preparation actions and making targeted seed collections of species that are difficult to source. If wild collection is part of your restoration plan, Remember to allow sufficient time to identify robust parent population locations and time to obtain any necessary collection permits. Keep in mind that sourcing seed from local remnant plant communities is ideal. Long-standing native habitat areas serve as models for restoration and design, as well as provide the highest quality resources for habitat creation and enhancement. However, the higher the quality a site is, the more likely it is to have higher levels of protection and therefore will require permits to collect from. And permitting, time, permitting turnaround time can be, can be quite extensive. Engaging, with part, what, engaging and partnering with other organizations and agencies can also help in obtaining your plant materials. So a few things to keep in mind. Habitat restoration requires patience, time, and an ongoing commitment to long-term management. Remember the saying, sleep, creep, and leap, which refers to the first one to four years of establishment. 
the first two years of a newly restored site will not be winning any beauty contests. Staying on top of early management practices are, are crucial to the long-term success of restoration efforts. This includes timely, timely conservation mowing to reduce competition for early and especially for slower establishing plants. Sites can also be restored in smaller sections over time, and in fact, can be highly beneficial to allow opportunities to evaluate and determine whether your initial management strategy is working successfully, or if you need to adapt your approach. In addition, installing plant materials over the course of time will provide successional diversity, which is also highly beneficial. This will also allow time to address the unique needs found in the microsites within larger restoration areas. Continue to look for opportunities to expand, enrich, and increase the quality of restored habitat areas. As we all know, there is no one and done when it comes to restoration. Species additions can be made over time, and the need for interceding within established habitat areas to increase diversity of function is a common and acceptable practice. Partnering with federal and state agencies, such as the Fish and Wildlife Service, NRCS, state DNRs, along with conservation organizations, such as Pollinator Partnership, Pheasants Forever, and others can increase and strengthen success rates by providing expertise and guidance, support for acquiring habitat materials, and assistance in conducting management actions, such as prescribed fire. I will wrap this up with leaving you with one of my favorite quotes. Thank you all for your interest in time. And now we'll see if there's any questions. Thanks, Elizabeth. You can come off mute and share your video now. Um, and any of our attendees, please feel free to continue putting your questions in the Q&A function. I'm going to be moderating them now for Elizabeth. Um, so our first question, uh, someone wants to know what's the best way to make room for better biodiversity in a restoration that's under 10 years old? Um, how to reduce overabundance of tall grasses without opening up niches to tall goldenrod or invasives? This is really an excellent question, both for Julia and Mary. Um, in restorations that have been established, um, for 10 years and under approximately 10 years, um, fall uh, prescribed fire um, is a really excellent way to uh, control um, at least uh, Canada goldenrod. I imagine that tall goldenrod is uh, acts somewhat the same. Um, mowing can also be effective to manage taller grasses and goldenrods, again, applied in the fall. Um, and the use of species additions um, and interseeding is really an excellent option for increasing biodiversity. Great. Thanks, Elizabeth. Um, Mary, Mary and Julia, you're welcome to hop back on too if you're still there and, and uh, add to that. Right. Um, so our, our next question here. Uh, someone wants to know, how important is it to use seed that's locally adapted to my ecoregion when adding plant material to the landscape? Um, and then they said they find it difficult to access such seed and often just hope to secure natives from a local nursery. That's a really, it's a really excellent question. Um, it depends on the project type and it depends on the uh, project uh, proximity to uh, potentially sensitive habitat areas. If you live near, let's say, a remnant prairie or remnant habitat um, or sensitive site, uh, sites that support uh, rare or endangered plant species, um, you definitely want to be using locally sourced um, local genotype materials um, to preserve the genetics that would be retained at those remnant sites. If your site um, has had a long history of disturbance, or is somewhat isolated and, and at a distance uh, from, from remnant and sensitive habitat areas, um, there's a little more leeway and give in terms of um, how far you can source your plant materials from without um, risking sensitive plant, plant populations. Um, 
some, it's a balancing act. There's definitely a, there's a balancing act um, that uh, all land stewards or land managers um, have, to, have to weigh out in terms of the availability of species, the cost of species, um, and, and, and what can be done um, on a site. Um, there was a second part to that question. Um, the second half of the question. Yeah, so second half was if you find it difficult to locate such oh, seed, yes. um, will just securing natives from a local nursery be fine? Yeah. Again, if this is if you're talking about um, a home a home site um, or a smaller planting, um, obtaining natives from local nurseries are an excellent option. Um, and I think that 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 most likely is the case if you're obtaining obtaining yeah, your plants from local nurseries. Um, seed sourcing is difficult. Uh, native seed, especially local genotype seed, is high in demand and it is uh, not highly available, which is why Pollinator Partnership has Project Wingspan program, um, which has uh, gone through a number of reiterations, um, which works with volunteers across the landscape to collect local genotype seed for habitat restoration um, due to the fact that it's not highly available uh, for purchase um, on the market. So um, the other option we could we could um, bring you into our efforts, uh, train you how to seed collect, and uh, you can join join the effort to collect seed and then redistribute that across the landscape. Um, you'd have that knowledge to then go forth and do continual collections uh, for your habitat area. Hey, and then we have a related question. Should we be looking at genotypes a bit south of us to compensate for climate warming trends? Another really excellent question. Um, there are provisional seed zones um, that have been developed by uh, plant conservation scientists um, that look at uh, ranges, plant ranges, and take into consideration uh, climate and, and soil type. If you Google uh, provisional seed zones, um, you'll, you'll pull up a map. The question of whether to or not to source from areas further south is it's, sort of, it's, a, hot, it's a hot topic in the plant conservation world, assisted migration. Um, for species that are able, that are more mobile, uh, a seed that is, that can uh, be transported uh, by air, um, wind, I should say, by winds, um, or smaller animals, herbaceous, smaller herbaceous seeds. Um, it's not as important or as recommended to source from regions further south, um, but for species that um, have less ability to migrate quickly um, due to the time and reproduction, such as like, uh, such as trees, larger woody species, um, there are Again, it's a hot topic for debate, but there are those that uh, believe that uh, bringing species from f regions further south, bringing them north, uh, so that they are so that there are species that are adapted to what we anticipate uh, future climate conditions to be, um, is is an option. Um, I, I would recommend also googling assisted migration and reading up on some of the pros and cons and, and caveats that. Um, along with that topic. Thanks. Um, so we've got a couple other related questions here. Uh, one is just asking, can you reiterate uh, the percentage numbers you listed for grasses and forbs? And then they were also at wondering how do trees play into that? Um, and then a related question, are those percentages by weight or seed count? Um, those are, those would be, uh, by, by seed count. Um, 70, when you're creating, when you're trying to create a pollinator habitat, if you're pollinator habitat, we recommend 75, a ratio of 75% forbs to 25% grasses. Um, again, seed is expensive, forbs, forb seed is, native forb seed is very expensive. Um, you can still establish a very high quality grassland habitat with a 60-40 ratio, 60% forbs, 40% grass. Um, but anything below that, um, you'll run into uh, competition issues sooner than later uh, as grasses do outcompete forb species. 
And then in terms of trees, how trees come into play, um, I don't include tree seeds in my uh, seed, seed calculators. When I think of adding, uh, making uh, additions uh, for species of trees, um, I recommend uh, purchasing plants, um, especially for the slow growing woody species. Um, I think you get a lot more satisfaction out of that too if you're incorporating that into your own habitat area uh, to plant a five gallon or even a one gallon woody shrub rather than trying to propagate it from seed. Great, we have time for one or two additional questions. Um, uh, Connie wants to know if you can talk more about genetic swamping and how that works. Sure, genetic swamping. So if you have um, some genetics uh, from, say, region A, and um, you bring them into, uh, say, region, region B, um, if, the, if the genetics are more aggressive or stronger from region A, and you bring them to region uh, B, which may be a, uh, a more sensitive population, uh, you can basically swamp out the nativity of the uh, second region's genetics um, causing it to be maladapted to particular conditions. Uh, region B may have, may have um, along the course of time, adapted to a particular microclimate, um, which allows it to have its strengths and diversity. And by bringing in uh, genetics from an outside distant population, um, you basically can flood out, you can flood out the original genetics found in a species population. That may not, and then, that, and then the manifestation of that may not be immediate, but that may come over the course of time. Um, and with the unpredictability of climate change um, and changes in precipitation and temperature, it, it can be dangerous to, to plant populations to their long-term persistence. Oh, thanks, that's fascinating. Um, so I think that's all the time we've got for right now. Um, but any other questions that weren't answered, we will be publishing answers to those at a later date and everyone will receive an email with those answers. Um, Elizabeth, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you so much, Isaac. I'm now excited to introduce our next speaker, Meredith Holm. Mary is a U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service wildlife biologist and also serves as the pollinator coordinator for the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative. Mary coordinates the collaborative multi-agency Great Lakes Pollinator Restoration um, Task Force, which is focused on galvanizing and implementing native bee conservation within the Great Lakes Basin. She has worked for the Services Partners for Fish and Wildlife Program for the last 12 years, restoring native habitat at, for migratory birds, teeny species, pollinators, and other wildlife. Mary earned her Bachelor of Science degree from Eastern Michigan University, a graduate certificate in wildlife management from Oregon State University, and is currently pursuing her master's in fish and wildlife. Please welcome Mary Holm. Hi everyone, I'm Mary Holm. I'm a wildlife biologist with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service's Partners for Fish and Wildlife Program. I work out of East Lansing, Michigan, and I've worked for the Partners Program Restoring Habitat for Wildlife, including pollinators, for the past 12 years. I've worked with partners to restore wetland, grassland, stream, and forest habitat in southern Michigan. I'm happy to talk to you today about habitat restoration planning. As I was preparing this presentation, I realized that I almost instinctively go through a lot of the planning steps without even thinking about them. So it was actually nice to get them down on paper. Just a note that you will see mainly pictures of insect pollinators in my presentation. Um, that's what I work a lot with um, and have a lot of photos of. Um, but of course, there are many other pollinators, including birds, bats, and mammals, um, and they will benefit from habitat restoration as well, as well as other wildlife. More on this in the goals and objectives section. All right, let's get started. <clears throat> Just a quick overview of what I'm gonna to cover today. We'll start with an outline of steps to successful habitat restoration plan. 
And then we'll dig into the details of each one of those steps with some tips and things to consider. Then we'll have time for questions and discussion at the end. A little recap on why we want to restore habitat for pollinators. Many native pollinators are in decline. And one of the causes of decline, that decline, include habitat loss, fragmentation, and degradation. So there's something we can do about that. But planning is a critical first step. What do you want to do? Why? How will you do it? When will you do it? Having a plan in place, even if it changes along the way, is helpful to you as you proceed through the restoration steps and the process. Documenting your plan and your actions will also be helpful to others in the future, different landowners, researchers, managers. <clears throat> I know everyone wants to jump into the action, but planning is necessary and it can be fun. <clears throat> you can learn a lot about your project site and with a little or a lot of patience and flexibility and even some help along the way, all the planning will be worth it. Just imagine arriving at a restoration site that you restored five years ago and seeing all the diverse plants and pollinators. I promise a little paperwork and planning now will all be worth it in the end. <clears throat> this is just a reminder. Um, it's really important. I keep I always tell people this and myself uh, that sometimes no matter how much research you do and planning, things won't always work out how you planned. And there can be many bumps along the way. It's okay and completely normal. Just be patient, have realistic expectations, and commit for the long haul. <clears throat> Here are the elements to include in a habitat restoration plan. Many of these, as I mentioned earlier, have become intuitive to me in the restoration process, and they may come at different points and times and in different orders, but they sh this should cover the main points. The site assessment, goals and objectives, capabilities and constraints, and you'll notice budget could have been included in constraint section, but since it's so important in the planning process, I thought it deserved its own bullet. Then we have site design, timeline, site preparation, materials, planting, and post-planting maintenance and long-term stewardship. Now we'll dive into each element, why they are important, and things to consider for each part of your plan. The first step in the planning process you'll want to do is a site assessment or evaluation. Prior to looking at the site, you can look from your office at aerial photos, Google Earth, historic images, land use and land type maps, soil maps. If you're working with a partner or landowner, at some point you'll need to go out, meet with them, and take a look at the site firsthand. Maps can only tell you so much. Learn about it. What is its history? Was it farmed, fallow, grazed? Was herbicide used? Were the Roundup Ready crops planted? <clears throat> Can you find a reference site, a site that maybe wasn't planted but is nearby? Um, what is the site now? How long ago was it farmed? How long was it fallow for? What is the size of the site? <clears throat> find out the boundaries of the property and the boundaries of your project site or the project area. Is it urban or rural? Are there invasive species such as autumn olive, buckthorn, spotted knapweed? Is it forested, open, wet or dry? <clears throat> what is the historic land cover type? Oak barren, prairie, mixed forests? Is it a schoolyard, um, home landscaping, or a rights of way corridor? All these things you will want to <clears throat> Um, find out and record. Are there areas of erosion where erosion might be an issue on the site? Steep hills. Uh, what directions do the face, faces slope? What's the aspect? Are there any issues on adjacent property? Um, that could be invasive species, um, herbicide or chemical use. We'll talk a little more about constraints in a bit. Um, but one that you should consider is access. Um, can you access the site with equipment? Um, is, is the access clearly marked? Is it part of the property? Is it an easement? You'll want to know all these things. <clears throat> you also might want to look into local ordinances um, about lines of site, 
uh, and vegetation height limits. Some uh, urban sites might have a maximum uh, vegetation height um, before it will have to be mowed. And you'll want to know this before proceeding. <clears throat> you'll also want to consider and, and find out if you can um, whether monitoring has been done on the site. Do you know what species, plant, and animal currently use the site? Are there any state or federally threatened for species or species of concern? <clears throat> These are all things that you can find out with a little research. Soils are important. So a major part of your site assessment, if you are gonna do any planting on this site, <clears throat> is knowing what your soils are. Knowing the drainage of the soil and the composition is important. The USDA Web Soil Survey is a great tool. You can look up your site, see what the soils are and a lot more. Soils are the base of your restoration. What plants you choose will depend on your soils, along with hydrology, climate, and other site elements. <clears throat> I use this for every project. <clears throat> um, I've included the link to the web soil survey up there. Okay, next, after you have a good idea of your site history, current condition, um, you'll want to determine your goals and objectives. What do you want? Or if you're working with a partner, what does your partner want out of the project? What is acceptable? What is realistic? For example, uh, you might have difficulty turning a forest into a grassland or a wet prairie into a savanna. If you work for a program and are helping a landowner, your goals and theirs might not be the same. <clears throat> but even restoring habitat for deer, turkey, pheasants, Songbirds or waterfowl can also provide quality habitat for pollinators. Are you focused on a specific pollinator, rare species, t &E species, or do you just want general diverse habitat for pollinators? Uh, if you're focusing on specific pollinators or you have a specific, specific pollinator in your area, for example, Carner Blue, you'll want to make sure you include their specific needs and resources. <clears throat> like Carner Blue, you would need to have lupin in your seed mix. If you're planting um, for monarch, you want to include milkweed. You also want to think about how long a commitment is the project. Is it, and is it to be managed in perpetuity for 10 years, 20 years? Um, we all hope for the long term, but you want to be realistic with this and your goals. Think about who will manage it, how they'll manage it, and how often. <clears throat> Once you have your goals pinned down, it's time to look at capabilities and constraints. This might happen while you're determining your goals. In any case, you should reevaluate your goals after assessing your constraints. Questions that will need answers include, do you have equipment? Do you need equipment <clears throat> to do site prep, to plant, to maintain the site? Are there constraints to herbicide use? Will you use it or not? Uh, how will it be planted? Will you be managing it and maintaining it or will the landowner or another partner? There are many programs out there that provide assistance with pollinator and wildlife habitat restoration, including the Partners Program, Peasants Forever, NRCS, uh, and the Michigan DNR, probably some other state DNRs as well, among others. Some of these programs even work together with landowners to assist in habitat projects. Reach out if you need help. There are a lot of experienced folks out there that have been doing this for a long time. And most of them would be more than happy to answer questions, give technical assistance, or even a helping hand. <clears throat> Budget. This can be a constraint or not, depending on your project and your budget. Uh, it's something to know when planning. How much can you or your partner spend on the project? How much do you have total and how much do you have for each step? Site prep, installation, management. Knowing this ahead of time will help you plan and will help you proceed with each step. It will, will affect the equipment you use, how and where you purchase materials, basically every part of your project. You may have to refine your goals and objectives based on your budget. But remember, 
you can do the project in stages if needed. For example, you could start with a base planting mix <clears throat> and then add plugs, shrubs, trees, and forbs periodically when you have the budget for it. As long as you know this ahead of time, you can incorporate it into your planting, your seeding rates, your plant placement, etc. Now that we have our site information, our goals and objectives, are aware of our constraints, more may come up, and have a budget. Next, we have fun designing the site. Make a map. <clears throat> you can use GIS, Google Earth, even drawing on paper. Start sketching out your site. This is an example of a map the landowner drew for me when we first met. <clears throat> Include the property lines, which on this one you can see in red, uh, where you have different habitat types. Here we have um, prairie area in the yellow, and then a more shaded savanna area in the green. <clears throat> What's not on here is the different soil types. Uh, which you can, which should also include. Because <clears throat> you'll need different mixes on those sites. You can also include where you want to plant shrubs, hedgerows, trees. Um, you can get as detailed as you want. Put in areas where you will leave habitat for nesting, snags, bare ground, dead wood, brush piles, nest boxes, or structures. There are many elements to include <clears throat> in your site design. This is another map um, of a project, and you can see the different colored areas here, the blue, the pink, the orange, and the green. These are all areas that would require slightly different site mixes based on the soils. <clears throat> Elements to think about when designing your site and to include, you wanna think about diversity. This includes diversity in structure of your plants, color, uh, function, bloom time, persistence, annuals or perennials. Complexity is good. What is native to the area? What's native to the region? You want to consider clumping plants together um, and you definitely want to provide food, water, and shelter for pollinator species. Remember when planning, especially trees and shrubs, to plant for maturity. <clears throat> Include areas of bare ground, plant for specialists or obligate species known to your site, and consider size, connectivity, ecosystem functionality, resilience, resistance, and redundancy. <clears throat> when putting together your planting plan or seed mix, make sure that you've included at least, at least three plants that bloom in each season, hopefully more. Here are examples um, of some plants from the Midwest region, we have lupine in the spring, monarda or bee balm in the summer, and then looks like New England aster in the fall. Certain species of pollinator are more active at different times of the year. Um, make sure you include early spring plants, spring flowering plants. They are important to many native bees. Here I've included um, some links and so, to some tools that are helpful in planning and the site design. The USDA plant database can be used to determine what's native to your site. You can zoom into the county level on this site. So it's helpful when putting together your plant mix. <clears throat> Another one that I use is specific to Michigan, but there might be some for, for different states, is the Michigan flora site, it's the University of Michigan herbarium. And you can look and see what is native to your specific county. <clears throat> There's also a link on here to pre-settlement vegetation and land type maps, which might be helpful um, if your site has gone through a lot of changes and you're not sure uh, where to start. <clears throat> this is a seed calculator. <clears throat> um, I apologize that it's not easy to read and it isn't very clear. Um, but you can use seed calculators to include aspects that are important to you when putting together your seed mix. I use these for every project. On top are the categories. We have the list of forbs. Uh, <clears throat> you can find out how many seeds per ounce from a lot of seed supplier sites. Um, Prairie Moon is a good one that lists out for each species that they sell, how many seeds per ounce there are. 
<clears throat> then you can also put in the bloom times, um, April, May, June, July, August, September you have there. So you can see that you have things blooming throughout the season. Then you can put in the cost. If you get an estimate from your suppliers, um, put in the cost, and then you can play around with the ounces per acre to determine what will fit for your budget and give you the best seeds per square foot um, for your site. I mentioned seeds per square foot because that's what I would focus on, not pounds per acre, and make sure to look at the bloom time. Um, if you don't know where to start with a seed mix, you can browse some native plant supplier sites to find examples of mixes for different types of um, uh, land and habitat. Just make sure if you use one of them that the plants are native to your area. <clears throat> Some that have good um, examples of seed mixes are Prairie Moon and Shooting Star Seed. You can also look on a uh, natural features inventory site, um, such as Michigan Natural Features Inventory, will give you information about plants found in specific habitat types, like oak barrens, oak savanna, wet prairies. This is, these are all good places to start when putting together your seed mix. Okay, now you're gonna need to figure it out when you will do all of the things you're planning. A lot of this may depend on your site, its current condition, and where you're getting your materials. Remember, you can plan a timeline, um, but be ready to be flexible with it. If your site is not progressing as fast as you thought it might um, through the site preparation stage. <clears throat> you want to consider where you're buying your seed or if you're collecting your seed, when you're going to plant in the fall, dormant seeding in the winter, spring, or maybe a combination, um, your site conditions and how long it'll take to prep the site for planting, and then consider maintenance and monitoring in your timeline as well. <clears throat> gathering materials. This will tie back into your objectives and budget. Where and how will you get your plant materials? This will also affect your timeline. Will you gather materials um, of seed? Are you buying seed? Are you doing a combination of both? If you're buying seed, um, <clears throat> are you buying it from a local supplier that has local seed? Or are you going to get regional seed? Um, be careful with this because a lot of people will say that it's local seed. Um, if you have a, a <clears throat> but they might be going to other suppliers to get the seed. So make sure that you ask for the origin of your seed when you're putting together your seed mixes and take that into consideration. Um, what type of plants are you going to plant? Forbs, grasses, sedges, trees, and shrubs. Um, at what maturity are you planting these? You know, mature trees, you know, or a couple year old trees. Um, plugs, <clears throat> seeds, uh, a mixture of annual, biennial, and perennial, all these things um, you'll need to, to know about um, in your plan. <clears throat> Other things that you can um, include and maybe should include, racks, brush piles, nest structures for pollinators. <clears throat> Next, site preparation. This is the most important step in the process um, after planning. It's critical to have good site preparation. I cannot emphasize enough how important this is. If you rush the site preparation, most likely you'll have a difficult time establishing diverse native habitat for pollinators or any wildlife. You will struggle. You'll need to decide what types of treatments your site requires. This will depend on what the existing site conditions are, if it's a fallow field or if it's cropland. Are you going to use site prep? You should have decided this earlier. Can you burn the site um, for site preparation? Is it small enough? Uh, maybe it's a schoolyard habitat or a, a small urban site where you can smother the vegetation or solarize it to remove the weeds instead of using herbicide. <clears throat> Are there nasty invasive species like napweed that might require repeated treatments prior um, to seeding? All these are things to consider um, in your site prep. And there's a picture there, uh, the one on the bottom was just a hayfield that was sprayed with um, glyphosate 
and several times before seeding. Um, and then the one on the right is a site that was planted, current prairie, but we are gonna add forbs to enhance the site. So they are burning it. And after we burned, then there's a little burn part. You can see on the lower right of that picture, you're gonna overseed with forbs to add diversity for pollinators. <clears throat> can you get the site to a condition that has some bare ground? That's important for good seed to soil contact. Julia is gonna talk more about this step in her presentation, but I just wanna emphasize that this will impact your budget and timeline and may require a bit of patience and flexibility. We're almost to the end of our planning steps. The next <clears throat> is planting. Some things you'll need to consider include how you will plant. There are a variety of ways and equipment that can be used in a restoration. Will you use a native no-till seed drill, seen here? <clears throat> or will you use a drop, drop seeder? Or maybe you'll broadcast the seed. Uh, or maybe you're gonna plant by hand. <clears throat> Trees can be planted by hand or with a planting machine. Uh, you might choose a combination of methods based on your site, the size, the budget, and your goals and objectives. Once you have determined how you will plant, <clears throat> you will need to decide who will plant. Will you do the planting? Do you have access to equipment? Will the landowner do the planting? Do they have equipment? Do they have experience planting? Or maybe you'll hire an experienced contractor. All things you need to decide. You might also want to have volunteers help with planting or some portion of the project planting. I often save some seed for school kids to spread after I've seeded the site. Or you can have them plant plugs in a pollinator garden. There are a lot of options. Another decision to make is when to plant. I'm not gonna tell you what time is the best time to plant because this will change depending on your site, your planting methods, your budget, your materials, and your objectives. You have a lot of options, including spring, fall, a dormant seeding in winter, or a combination of the above. For example, some plant grass in the spring and wait until the following winter to plant forbs. When you plant may impact your design and your seed mixes as well. You can always go back and add. You can add more forbs, trees, and shrubs as your budget and schedule allows. The last part of your planning should incorporate what happens after the planting is done. What is required the first year, the second year, third year, every five years, and so on. Does it need to be mowed? Um, after it's been planted during establishment? If so, when, to what height, and by whom? Have a plan that you can go back to every year that gives instructions on basic maintenance as needed. Restorations will always need some form of management, whether periodic mowing, burning, or invasive species monitoring and treatment. Monitoring will help you to know if your project is going well. Is it going how you thought it would go? Is the landowner happy with the project? Did you get the results you expected? If not, why? And can you make modifications? It's also very important to keep good records of every step that you take. And part of that is having this habitat restoration plan to record the steps you're taking. Develop this plan, record your actions, and share your experiences and lessons learned. <laughs> keep learning. It's fun. Thank you very much <clears throat> for your time today. And now we'll see if there's any questions. Thank you so much, Mary. Hi. And with that, we'd like to invite you all to upload your questions to the Q&A function. And I will note, I want to respond to one uh, question um, that one of our participants posted in regard to getting the links and other references uh, that speakers have included in your presentations. We will send um, an email to all registrants when the webinars um, are up and posted um, on our website. We will also compile a resource document that includes all the links that were and, and references that were provided by our, our speakers and presenters. 
Um, so Connie's asking, is there a C calculator on the web that one can use? And do you recommend anyone in particular? Uh, that's a great question. I think some um, USDA NRCS um, website, if you Google that, you can find some seed calculators. Um, I'm also happy to share the one that, that we use. Uh, I don't know where it actually um, originally came from, but we've kind of modified it and added things that are important to us. Um, I could give that to you, Elizabeth, and maybe you could share it. Absolutely. All right. Um, the next question is, I hear, is someone posted, I hear about dark diversity in Prairie Community Assembly. Are, these are populations that exist in the prairie but don't express themselves. If they don't bloom, can't, they can't benefit pollinators. What can I do to give latent species their day in the sun? Is it just a matter of succession? That's the first time I've heard the dark diversity term. Um, that's interesting. Uh, if there's, you know, some plants take longer to bloom than others, um, you know, so it might just be having the right conditions um, and the right timing for those plants. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the great thing about native prairies and, and pollinator habitat is it changes over time and being able to see those changes, different things blooming different years, you'll see more of certain flowers planting. Um, so yeah, I don't know much more about the dark diversity term, so sorry. <laughs> so I've heard that as well. Um, there are, uh, we have a number of questions about glyphosate um, and the use of glyphosate um, and its longevity um, and resilience um, in the soil. Um, can you speak to that a little bit in your experience in terms of um, yeah. the vulnerability of uh, species or, or native plants? Sure. Um, as I think Julia mentioned, glyphosate, the residual time is pretty low in the soil. Um, you know. And that will also depend on how frequently it was used in the past. For most of our prairie restorations, you know, if, it, if it's not cropland but has a regular history of application, you're not using, a, you know, you're not applying huge amounts of glyphosate over years and years. So uh, your residual time is not going to be very much. Um, that being said, I know there are, you know, I've worked with partners that are concerned and don't want to use herbicide and when I first started doing that, it was kind of scary, like, oh my gosh, you're gonna have so many weeds and it's gonna be impossible to control them. But there are other ways, like you mentioned in the um, presentation, smothering, solarizing, but really those aren't feasible for large sites. Um, so, you know, I've worked on some sites in Detroit, they're small, um, less than an acre. And we actually did some, they were, you know, grass parks sod grass. And we did some tilling, which, well, light tilling, disking, um, which wouldn't be good. It's not great for pollinators for nesting. Um, but in this case, they didn't want to use herbicides, so we did use that. And then as long as the partner that you're working with is willing to commit to mowing, a lot of mowing that first year after planting, we've had some success with that, a lot of success. Um, so there are, it'll depend on your site, obviously, and the conditions there and the soil and everything, but um, there are ways to do um, restorations without herbicide. It just takes a lot, lot more effort. Um, so you just have to realize that going in. You'll want to adjust your seed mix, how much, how many seeds per square foot you're planting. Um, we did that on those sites as well. As, I mean, we probably put five acres worth of seed on two acres. Um, so that you have more plants hopefully germinating to outcompete any weeds. And you're always going to have weeds. Um, and I think Julie mentioned too, but the annual weeds you can control easily with mowing. Um, and then, you know, treating any areas, if there's like thistle, you can control that with mowing as well. <clears throat> Excellent. And can you expand a little bit more? more on um, your point of if you're not using herbicide and you're doing uh, repetitive mowing, how, how frequently are you recommending a repetitive mowing and, and for how long would that sure. as a management require? Yeah, again, it'll depend on the site. On the sites that we've done, 
um, that first year you're going to want to mow it every time it gets up to like 10 inches. I mean, it's, and, and it's hard for people because as soon as they see something flowering, they don't want to mow because they're afraid it's not going you know, it's going to hurt the plant. It's not going to come back, but it will, it'll come back better. Um, so and we've had people mow that whole first year, you know, several times, and then even the second year. Um, but every site is different. So I go out and look at the site and meet with the landowner and make sure you don't want to just tell someone to do something without seeing how the site is responding. So you just want to make sure you're looking at the site and seeing um, how it's responding to that mowing. Because maybe you only need to do it a few times the first year and a couple times the second year, and then you'll be okay. But uh, every site deserves its own attention and, and looking at it, seeing how it's responding. Absolutely. Thank you. The importance of monitoring. Um, the next question um, is asking for uh, your recommendations for the best way to do planting. Um, and does that depend on the time of year? So methodologies for proceeding implementation. Um, you know, there are better times of year that are recommended. So if you're asking kind of about, you know, should you broadcast or drill or um, like that, it will depend on your site and the time of year. If you have a really wet site, for example, that's really wet in the spring and you can't get in with the drill, then you might want to consider doing a dormant seeding on that site. Um, and you might want to consider like when the ground is frozen, doing a broadcast seeding so that over the winter that seed can get worked into the soil. Um, and then you don't have your contractors getting stuck in the mud and, and just making a mess. And it's, you know, so it's it's really all going to depend on your site. Um, you know, there's not really one that is better than the other for every site. It, it's really dependent on the site. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, Kyle is asking if you can elaborate on the process of solarization for smaller sites. Yeah, and I haven't done this, but I've read a little bit about it. Um, so I'm not an expert at all. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, you can use black plastic and you put it on the vegetation and they say to leave it for like a year. Um, you know, and a lot of people are impatient, but so it takes some patience. You'd have to leave it for a whole growing season. And then that's supposed to, you know, kill if you have a sunny site, obviously it's not going to work if it's shaded, but um, kill the vegetation. Uh, and then you can plant. I don't know. I mean, I would still think you would want to do that regular mowing after you plant because um, there's some things that um, would, will still come back um, and depending on the, how deep their roots are and things like that. Um, but if you have a small site and you can try it out, um, then it, you're not disturbing the soil as much. You're not using herbicides. So it might be a direction you want to go. Absolutely. I've also used the, the a method of using clear plastic. Yep. Instead of black. Yep. Sorry. I've said black. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. yeah. Okay, I've heard people use newspaper too, which is like the smothering versus the solarization. Just using newspaper to smother all the plants. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Chris writes, we learned previously how many native how many native bees need bare ground for nesting. And you mentioned it under site planning. How much bare ground should you allow for? And how do you keep it bare when weeds and pioneer plants will naturally try to take over through succession? Is it one bigger area of bare ground or just not seeding too heavily to allow for more bare ground patches around the plants? And then do you use herbicide on those bare ground on the bare ground areas periodically? Yeah, I don't know if there's a specific amount, like a percentage of bare ground. If there is, I, I'm, I'm not aware of it, but I know it's really important for ground nesting bees. Um, and if, if you're, you know, it depends on your objectives, I guess. Like the one I just mentioned in Detroit, we planted so heavy, there is not a lot of bare ground because there's a lot of plants. But you could go in at such a small site and you could pull, you could literally pull out some of those plants. And then you'd have some areas of bare ground. Um, but if you have a bigger site, then yeah, you want to make sure you're you're getting good coverage with your seed, but you're not planting like say your native grasses too many too close together because the clumps are just going to get huge and take up space and you're not going to have much space in between. It's a lot easier with the forbs that don't take up as much space than the grass um, to end up with bare ground. 
You can also go in and do like light disturbance after, like if you're mowing, not tilling or disking, but maybe with some tools just to clear out some weeds in between. Um, I don't know for like a huge site, um, burning is, is a good tool for maintenance after your prairie is established. So like after year three, um, I know there's studies seeing the impact of burning on, on ground nesting bees too, um, but burning after that, you might have a little bit more bare ground that will be available for nesting. Um, so that's another tool you could use. Fantastic, thank you. Um, Maggie asked if you can uh, kindly repeat some of the companies uh, that you had mentioned for sourcing seeds um, and uh, your recommendations uh, for how to ask about the origins. Okay, and I, I can tell you their names. I'm not, I'm not recommending these. They're just some that we um, uh, use for reference. Um, there's Shooting Star Seed, which I believe is either in Wisconsin or Minnesota. Um, there's a um, Prairie Moon Nursery. Um, so if you just Google those, you can get to their sites. And and <clears throat> what's great about I think it's Prairie Moon is they have for each species you can look up how many seeds per ounce. Um, you would get, you know, how many seeds are in an ounce worth of weight of seed, um, and then when they bloom, what the site conditions are. So all those things you want to take into consideration in your planning and putting together your seed mix, you can find out from some of those. And then what was the second part of the question? Can you repeat that, please? So how, how do you ask, how do you appropriately ask uh, the vendors about the seed origin? Oh. Just ask. <laughs> I usually I put together my seed calculator and I have a column on the end that says origin. And I send that to them to ask them to fill in the prices. And then I just and I might have like Great Lakes origin or whatever the origin is you want printed in bold on the top. But then remind them, you know, please fill out the origin of the seed. And they will. I'm, I mean, I haven't gotten anyone that refused to fill that out. Um, but it is important because if you just if you don't put that on there and you don't ask, you might get lupin from Oregon, um, and I don't, you don't want to be planning that in Michigan. So <laughs> it's important. Very true. Um, Arlene wanted to add that OPN or Ohio Prairie Nursery uh, has native seed for Ohio. Yeah. All right. Um, let's see, a couple other questions in here. Um, um, species to plant in a grass buffer along a trail or for a fire break, recommendations for species of species of grass to use for a fire break. A lot of fire breaks we um, leave as cool season grass because um, you're going to be mowing them a lot. Um, so you don't necessarily want to plant the native grasses that are going to be clump grasses um, because if they're fire breaks you want something that's easy to mow um, so just a lot of cool season um, i think it's fescue and I'm, I'm not sure if the name there's like red some some native cool seasons um i'm blanking on what their um, names are right now but there are some native cool season grasses um, that you can plant for those fire breaks <clears throat> And you could put forbs in it too, but if if you're going to be mowing them a lot, um, you might want to invest a lot of cost into that. Um, that's just up to you. Maybe some shorter growing species would be a good idea. Excellent, excellent. I think we have time for about one or two more questions. Um, Chris asks, can you comment on approaches for com for combating um, common and cutleaf teasel? Uh, sites that have been neglected for seven year, for several years and have pretty heavy pressure. For teasel? Yeah. Um, I don't worry if there's just a little bit. I mean, of any, you know, if there's just a little bit, but if it's taken over your whole site, um, herbicide can be used on it. Um, you can also time your mowing so it doesn't go to seed. Um, those are really the, the two management aspects that we we use for teasel and a lot of other invasives. <clears throat> All right. Thank you so much again, Mary. We really appreciate your, your time, your presentation, and responses to all these questions. Sure. Thank you. All right. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Mary. Hi. And with that, we'd like to invite you all to upload your questions to the Q&A function. And I will note, I want to respond to one uh, question um, that one of our participants posted in regard to getting the links and other references uh, that speakers have included in your presentations. We will send um, an email to all registrants when the webinars um, are up and posted um, on our website. We will also compile a resource document that includes all the links that were and, and references that were provided by our, our speakers and presenters. Um, so Connie's asking, is there a C calculator on the web that one can use? And do you recommend anyone in particular? Oh, that's a great question. I think some um, USDA NRCS um, website, if you Google that, you can find some seed calculators. Um, I'm also happy to share the one that, that we use. Uh, I don't know where it actually um, originally came from, but we've kind of modified it and added things that are important to us. Um, I could give that to you, Elizabeth, and maybe you could share it. Absolutely. All right. Um, the next question is, I hear, is someone posted, I hear about dark diversity in Prairie Community Assembly. Are, these are populations that exist in the prairie but don't express themselves. If they don't bloom, can't, they can't benefit pollinators. What can I do to give latent species their day in the sun? Is it just a matter of succession? That's the first time I've heard the dark diversity term. Um, that's interesting. Uh, if there's, you know, some plants take longer to bloom than others, um, you know, so it might just be having the right conditions um, and the right timing for those plants. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the great thing about native prairies and, and pollinator habitat is it changes over time and being able to see those changes, different things blooming different years, you'll see more of certain flowers planting. Um, so yeah. I don't know much more about the dark diversity term, so sorry. <laughs> First time I've heard that as well. Um, there, are, uh, we have a number of questions about glyphosate um, and the use of glyphosate um, and its longevity um, and resilience um, in the soil. Um, can you speak to that a little bit in your experience in terms of um, yeah. the vulnerability of uh, species or, or native plants? Sure. Um, as I think Julia mentioned, glyphosate's the residual time is pretty low in the soil, um, you know, and that will also depend on how frequently it was used in the past. For most of our prairie restorations, you know, if, it, if it's not cropland with has a regular history of application, you're not using, you know, you're not applying huge amounts of glyphosate over years and years. So. Uh, your residual time is not going to be very much. Um, that being said, I know there are, you know, I've worked with partners that are concerned and don't want to use herbicide. And when I first started doing that, it was kind of scary, like, oh my gosh, you're going to have so many weeds and it's going to be impossible to control them. But there are other ways, like you mentioned in the um, presentation, smothering, solarizing, but really those aren't feasible for large sites. Um, so, you know, I've worked on some sites in Detroit, they're small, um, less than an acre, and we actually did some, they were, you know, grass parks, sod grass, and we did some tilling, which, well, light tilling, disking, um, which wouldn't be good, it's not great for pollinators for nesting, um, but in this case, they didn't want to use herbicides, so we did use that, and then as long as the partner that you're working with is willing to commit to mowing, a lot of mowing that first year after planting, we've had some success with that, a lot of success. Um, so there are, it'll depend on your site, obviously, and the conditions there and the soil and everything, but um, there are ways to do um, restorations without herbicide. It just takes a lot, lot more effort. Um, so you just have to realize that going in. You'll want to adjust your seed mix, how much, how many seeds per square foot you're planting. Um, we did that on those sites as well. As, I mean, we probably put five acres worth of seed on two acres. 
um, so that you have more plants hopefully germinating to outcompete any weeds. And you're always going to have weeds. Um, and I think Julie mentioned too, but the annual weeds you can control easily with mowing. Um, and then, you know, treating any areas, if there's like thistle, you can control that with mowing as well. <clears throat> Excellent. And can you expand a little bit more, more on um, your points of if you're not using herbicide and you're doing uh, repetitive mowing, how, how frequently are you recommending a repetitive mowing and, and for how long would that sure. as a management require? Yeah, again, it'll depend on the site. On the sites that we've done, um, that first year you're going to want to mow it every time it gets up to like 10 inches. I mean, it's and, and it's hard for people because as soon as they see something flowering, they don't want to mow because they're afraid it's not going to, you know, it's going to hurt the plant. It's not going to come back, but it will. It'll come back better. Um, so and we've had people mow that whole first year, you know, several times and then even the second year. Um, but every site is different. So I go out and look at the site and meet with the landowner and make sure you don't want to just tell someone to do something without seeing how the site is responding. So you just want to make sure you're looking at the site and seeing um, how it's responding to that mowing. Because maybe you only need to do it a few times the first year and a couple of times the second year, and then you'll be okay. But uh, every site deserves its own attention and, and looking at it, seeing how it's responding. Absolutely. Thank you. The importance of monitoring. Um, the next question um, is asking for uh, your recommendations for the best way to do planting um, and does that depend on the time of year? So methodologies for proceeding implementation um, and are there better times of year that are recommended? So if you're asking kind of about, you know, should you broadcast or drill or um, like that, it will depend on your site and the time of year. If you have a really wet site, for example, that's really wet in the spring and you can't get in with the drill, then you might want to consider doing a dormant seeding on that site. Um, and you might want to consider, like when the ground is frozen, doing a broadcast seeding so that over the winter that seed can get worked into the soil. Um, and then you don't have your contractors getting stuck in the mud and, and just making a mess. And it's, you know, so it's, it's really all going to depend on your site. Um, you know, there's not really one that is better than the other for every site. It, it's really dependent on the site. <clears throat> Great, thank you. Um, Kyle is asking if you can elaborate on the process of solarization for smaller sites. Yeah, and I haven't done this, but I've read a little bit about it. Um, so I'm not an expert at all. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, you can use black plastic and you put it on the vegetation and they say to leave it for like a year. Um, you know, and a lot of people are impatient, but so it takes some patience. You'd have to leave it for a whole growing season. And then that's supposed to, you know, kill if you have a sunny site, obviously it's not going to work if it's shaded, but um, kill the vegetation. Uh, and then you can plant. I don't know. I mean, I would still think you would want to do that regular mowing after you plant because um, there's some things that um, would, will still come back um, and depending on the, how deep their roots are and things like that. Um, but if you have a small site and you can try it out, um, then it, you're not disturbing the soil as much. You're not using herbicides. So it might be a direction you want to go. Absolutely. I've also used a, the, a method of using clear plastic. Yep. Instead of black. Yep. Sorry. I said black. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. yeah. Okay, I've heard people use newspaper too, which is like the smothering versus the solarization. Just using newspaper to smother all the plants. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Chris writes, we've learned previously how many native how many native bees need bare ground for nesting. And you mentioned it under site planning. How much bare ground should you allow for? And how do you keep it bare when weeds and pioneer plants will naturally try to take over through succession? Is it one bigger area of bare ground or just not seeding too heavily to allow for more bare ground patches around the plants? And then do you use herbicide on those bare ground and the bare ground areas periodically? Yeah, I don't know if there's a specific amount, like a percentage of bare ground. If there is, I, I'm, I'm not aware of it, but I know it's really important for ground nesting bees. Um, and if, 
if you're you know, it depends on your objectives, I guess. Like the one I just mentioned in Detroit, we planted so heavy. There is not a lot of bare ground because there's a lot of plants, but you could go in at such a small site and you could pull, you could literally pull out some of those plants and then you'd have some areas of bare ground. Um, but if you have a bigger site, then yeah, you wanna make sure you're, you're getting good coverage with your seed, but you're not planting like say your native grasses too many too close together because the clumps are just going to get huge and take up space and you're not going to have much space in between it's a lot easier with the forbs that don't take up as much space than the grass um, to end up with bare ground you can also go in and do like light disturbance after like if you're mowing not tilling or disking but maybe with some tools just to clear out some weeds in between um, I don't know for like a huge site, um, burning is, is a good tool for maintenance after your prairie is established. So like after year three, um, I know there's studies seeing the impact of burning on, on ground nesting bees too, um, but burning after that, you might have a little bit more bare ground that will be available for nesting. Um, so that's another tool you could use. Fantastic, thank you. Um, Maggie asked if you can uh, kindly repeat some of the companies uh, that you had mentioned for sourcing seeds um, and uh, your recommendations uh, for how to ask about the origins of those. Okay, seeds. and I, I, I can tell you their names. I'm not, I'm not recommending these. They're just some that we um, uh, use for reference. Um, there's Shooting Star Seed, which I believe is either in Wisconsin or Minnesota. Um, there's a um, Prairie Moon Nursery, um, so if you just Google those, you can get to their sites. And and <clears throat> what's great about I think it's Prairie Moon is they have for each species you can look up how many seeds per ounce um, you would get. You know how many seeds are in an ounce worth of weight of seed, um, and then when they bloom, what the site conditions are. So all those things you want to take into consideration in your planning and putting together your seed mix, you can find out from some of those. And then what was the second part of the question? Can you repeat that please? So how, how do you ask, how do you appropriately ask uh, the vendors about the seed origin? Oh, just ask. <laughs> I Usually I put together my seed calculator and I have a column on the end that says origin and I send that to them to ask them to fill in the prices. And then I just, and I might have like, Great Lakes origin or whatever the origin is you want printed in bold on the top, but then remind them, you know, please fill out the origin of the seed. And they will. I'm, I mean, I haven't gotten anyone that refused to fill that out. Um, but it is important because if you just if you don't put that on there and you don't ask, you might get lupin from Oregon. Um, and I don't, you don't want to be planning that in Michigan. So <laughs> it's important. Very true. Um, Arlene wanted to add that OPN or Ohio Prairie Nursery uh, has native seed for Ohio. Yeah. All right. Um, let's see, a couple other questions in here. Um, um, species to plant in a grass buffer along a trail or for a fire break, recommendations for species of species of grass to use for a fire break? A lot of fire breaks we um, leave as cool season grass because um, you're going to be mowing them a lot. Um, so you don't necessarily want to plant the native grasses that are going to be clump grasses because um, if they're fire breaks, you want something that's easy to mow. Um, so just a lot of cool season um, I think it's fescue, and I'm, I'm not sure what the name, there's like red, some, some native cool seasons. Um, I'm blanking on what their um, names are right now, but there are some native cool season grasses um, that you can plant for those fire breaks. <clears throat> and you can put forbs in it too, but if, if you're going to be mowing them a lot, um, you might not want to invest a lot of cost into that. Um, that's just up to you. Maybe some shorter growing species would be a good idea. Excellent, excellent. I think we have time for about one or two more questions. Um, Chris asks, can you comment on approaches for com for combating um, common and cut leaf teasel, uh, sites that have been neglected for, seven for several years and have pretty heavy pressure? 
for Teasel. Yeah. Um, I don't worry if there's just a little bit, I mean, of any, you know, if there's just a little bit, but if it's taken over your whole site, um, herbicide can be used on it. Um, you can also time your mowing so it doesn't go to seed. Um, those are really the, the two management aspects that we, we use for teasel and a lot of other invasives. <clears throat> yes, All right. Thank you so much again, Mary. We really appreciate your, your time, your presentation and responses to all these questions. Sure. Thank you. All right. Thank you. And that concludes our third workshop. Again, I'd like to extend our sincere gratitude to Mary Holm and Julia Kemnes for their phenomenal presentations and to extend our appreciation to all of you for your participation and interests. Please join us for our next workshop focused on project implementation, which will be held in two weeks on December 1st. Thank you all again.